Good morning, and welcome to Church of the Valley this morning. I have Amelia Claire with me this morning. Can you say hi to everybody? It's a great time to have Mark and singing with us on worship this morning, and Megan here, and Amelia joining us. Amelia's two and a half now, going to be three soon, and they're just visiting from Idaho, and we're having a great visit. Mark's going to fly home today, and Megan and Amelia get to stay a few more days. Um, so just rejoice with us as we get to spend a little time with our, with our kids. And this one, who's growing up so fast, we feel like every time we see her, she's added a few pounds. <laughs> but welcome this morning, and we trust that you guys have all had a great week. And just trusting in what God wants to do in all of our lives. He seems to just keep working on and molding that clay. And making us more like him as we just trust in him and lean into his arms and his care. And uh, let's just pray. Father God, we thank you this morning for your great love. And Lord, we just thank you that you're in control of all things, Lord. Oh, Jesus, we just love you this morning. We thank you that we could meet. It was supposed to rain this morning and we were concerned about that. But Lord, you held back the, held back the showers even though we need them so that we might be able to worship for this hour. So, Lord, we just commit our service and ourselves to you, Lord. We look forward to all that you want to do in this place and in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to read to you this morning from Psalm 16. Psalm 16, keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said, to, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord, and apart from you I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom all my, is all my delight. The sorrows of those who will increase, who run after other gods. And I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion in my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. And I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. And I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, and I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices. My body also will re rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. And you will fill me with joy in your presence. I love that. He promises to fill us with joy in his presence. With eternal pleasures at your right hand. So God, we commit our worship service to you this morning, Lord. And God, we look forward to the day when we'll be, it was re reunited in heaven. But God, right now we look forward to reuniting right here as a church body. In this place, Lord, as you take care of covid Lord Jesus, and you bring healing to our land, we ask in your name. God, we pray over our elections that you would give us wisdom, that each one of us would take responsibility and take it seriously to vote. And God, we just pray for your blessing. We pray for just your encouragement to those who need encouragement this morning, your provision to those who need provision, your strength and power to those who need strength and power. And we love you, Lord, and we thank you, and we bless your holy name. Amen. Let's worship together.
me go ahead and be seated. Nice and loud. Good morning. Good morning. When you move, see the room. There's a big room to move into, right? Yeah. All right, so, you know, we're in our series, the book of Hebrews. Jesus is more than enough. And we're in chapter 5, so if you have your Bibles out or your phones, find Hebrews chapter 5. And yes, the series title is Jesus is More Than Enough, but today's message is titled, As I See It, You Have Three Choices. So to find out what I mean in chapter 5, let's read chapter 5. So right at verse 1. And glasses here. Right verse 1, it says, Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is also able to gently, deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has, off, off, this is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of other people. No one takes his honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petition with loud cries and tears to, one, to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. That means his obedience, too. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And was designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact... Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant or a baby, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray right now, Lord, as we go into this passage, Lord, to understand why people have gone astray, Lord, and understand this uh, whole idea of, uh, of the metaphor of milk, Lord. And understand, Father, that you do have three choices for us, Father, that, Lord, uh, sometimes we're just maintaining as a Christian. Sometimes we're backsliding. But today, Father, I pray that we really come to the point of knowing that we can be more than conquerors. We can be victors in this, this life, Lord. To know that we have the Holy Spirit living inside us, that we can walk in abundance. In your favor, we pray. We ask that you bless us this very day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, um, let me ask you a question. What do you know about milk? I, I'm, got some answers? Comes from a cow. Makes you sick. Why? What else? Comes from a cow. Does the body good? Does the body good? Comes from a cow, milk, and um, well, milk is referenced in the Bible several times. So, you know, we know, we have this saying, "The land of milk and honey," for example. But here in Hebrews chapter five, you know what it's used for? It's used to shock us. I think maybe you may understand that, huh? It's shock us. And using milk as a metaphor in First Peter two two, Peter. He is in no way chiding people, as the writer of Hebrews does here in chapter 5 of, uh, of Hebrews. Peter, he uses milk simply as a nourishing food, because his emphasis is on desire, desire of the pure milk, not on death. But the Hebrew writers, the Hebrews writer here, and some people think it's Paul, just in case you guys want to argue that one day, um, 
uses milk as a metaphor because he wants to shock the Hebrews. He wants to shock them into comprehending how far they have slipped away from their former state of conversion. He wants to shock them. Right? And so Paul, uh, he uses this, uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he uses milk as a metaphor there too for the weak. He says this, And I, brethren, and I, brethren, do not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able to. Paul judges the Corinthians as weak based upon their behavior, based upon their attitude, because it reflected no spiritual progress. So what he did is he fed these immature Christians elementary school level knowledge. Elementary school level knowledge. Because things of greater depth, they, they would go on, it would have gone on unappreciated. It would have gone on, it would, they would have misunderstood it. They would have unused it. You know, these references directly tie spiritual diet to growth and understanding, behavior and attitude. Let's give that, I want you guys to get this again. A spiritual diet leads to growth and understanding, behavior and attitude. Paul's milk metaphors and the Hebrews milk metaphor here, they're, re they're really scathing put downs. And undoubtedly, he seriously hurt the feelings of many in the congregation. You know, but yet he is yet he's free from he's free before God of any charges of offense. Because you know what? He's right here. He doesn't question their conversion, but he certainly rebukes their lack of growth. He rightly judges that they need to have their feelings hurt so they can salvage what remains of their conversation, of their not conversion. In the business world, we call these crucial conversations, right, Deborah? So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the embarrassing immaturity that required him to feed the people like babies, it also produced strife and factions in the congregation, proving that the people here were far more carnal than they were converted. The Hebrew account here, it's even more complex. The people had once been mature. They had once been mature, growing Christians, but they regressed. You know, it's a situation vaguely similar to elderly people. In fact, Danny asked me about that this morning. Well, elderly people uh, become afflicted with dementia. You know, except that, in this case, it's faith. It's love. It's character. It's conduct. It's attitudes. Those were all being lost rather than their mental faculties. This resulted in people just drifting aimlessly. The Hebrews and us, if we're honest, we're being charged with being lazy listeners. Not putting forth the effort to meditate and apply what is taught to us. For the Hebrews and us, not using what we hear is proof enough that we're not thinking through the seriousness or the practical applications of the teaching. In other words, we're not assimilating what we hear. And then the result is a lack of faith, and as a consequence, faithlessness. But right now, are we dealing with faithlessness? I think we are. We've got seven months or so of this COVID situation. And sometimes we're not seeing any way out of it. We've started to see more people even get sick. You know, Riverside County just, uh, they came out of uh, purple, went into red, and went back into purple again. Here in San Bernardino, the 1,000th person, person died from COVID. We need to have faith that God is going to heal. Right? And a lot of times it begins by what? Us getting upon our knees. By taking upon the word of God. That he is the truly the healer of all of our disease. The people here in Hebrews, they just frittered away a large amount of time that would have been far better spent on spiritual growth. God has given us seven months for what? Spiritual growth. Huh? And it's obvious that it's out there because we see it in the world. We also see it in the church. We have this perfect opportunity to even come together on a Sunday morning in a parking lot where we might at risk getting wet. So I praise you guys for uh, being out here today. But know this, the writer of Hebrews here, he attempts to shame and shock them into realizing how far they have slipped by by calling these grown people, and some of them, most likely even elderly people, 
He's calling them infants. He's calling them babies. He goes so far to tell them that they're unacquainted with and unskilled in the teaching of righteousness. What an insult, huh? But you can't take it from an insult if it's true. In other words, he attributes to them the one particular trait of infants. That they do not understand the difference between right and wrong. A characteristic that defines immaturity. A parent must instruct and chasten a child until it understands. You know, us with kids, we know what it's like, don't we? You know? One of the things that uh, we learned a long time ago, I actually learned this with uh, Kim and Kevin, is uh, first time obedience. You ever got that one? You ever had that one? Working on it. Working on it, right? Uh, first time obedience, I tell you. We, we, the people in here in Hebrews, they're being offended because, you know what? They're not obedient. The Bible provides ample evidence that a poor spiritual diet results in a spiritually weak and diseased person. Just as a poor physical diet works to erode and eventually destroy a person's physical vitality. I can tell you that from cholesterol. In the same way, we can see that a person can be in good spiritual health, but lose it through being lazy or, being, or some other form of neglect. You know, just as a mature adult needs good, solid nourishment to maintain his, his vitality and remain free of disease, the spiritual, the spiritual parallel follows. In order to grow spiritual, in order to grow spirit, to spiritual, that's right. In order to grow to spiritual maturity and vitality, a mature Christian needs solid spiritual nourishment. Similarly, actively apply to continue growing and prevent regressing or backsliding as opposed to the Hebrew sluggish spiritual deterioration. Guys, you have to work at it. Now, we know the condition, right? That we got the condition set up here. Paul said, or the Hebrew writers set it all up for us. We need to have an answer, don't we? We need to have some practical applications here to truly simulate that. But before we do that, I want to ask you this. How open-minded are you? Can, you? can you be honest with yourself just as the writer of Hebrews is being honest with you? Now just imagine. Just imagine. I believe there are three, three ways to go with this. First of all, you can just be a maintainer. Jesus calls that lukewarm people, right? Maintainer. Let that sink in. Or you can be a backslider. Not a backstabber. Backslider. Or you can be an overcomer. So as you check off, right now in your mind, I know you're doing this, in your spirit, as you check off which one you are, how does it make you feel? Now, let's find an answer to how you want to be. Because I can just assume which one you want to be. The first answer is this. We are commanded in Scripture to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in 2 Peter 3.18. This growth is it's spiritual growth. It means growing in faith. So the first thing is growing in faith. At the moment we receive Christ as our Savior, we are born again spiritually into God's family. But just as a newborn baby requires nourishing milk for growth and good development, so also a baby Christian requires spiritual food for growth. Because it tells us in 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3, it says this, Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. You know, milk is used in the New Testament as a symbol to what is basic to the Christian life. The basic of Christian life. Does everyone want, like, basic? Do you want the basic of anything? You guys go look at cars and think, I'm just going to buy the base model car. No, I mean, you might, but, you know, but you want something special about it. At least you want, at least you want one of hybrid things, okay? Right? So I got you on that one, right? But you know what? You need a diet that's not just basic. You want the meat and potatoes to it. But as the baby grows, its diet changes also to solid foods, right? Don't you go from liquid to solids? 
right? And it's funny, as you get old and older, you might go back to liquids. But anyway, we don't want to go that either, but we want solid food. So babies, as they grow, they need solid food. And with this in mind, read how the writer of Hebrews admonishes these Christians. He says this, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. That's embarrassing, isn't it? To be caught up in that, that you've got to be taught all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, a baby, is not acquainted with the teachings of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Why is it so having a problem? You know, why do so many Christians have a problem with evil? They shouldn't. They should recognize it, fight against it. You know, Paul saw the same problem with the Corinthian believers. They had not grown in their faith, and he could, not, and he could only give them milk because they were not ready for solid food. Now think about this as a comparison between a human baby and a baby Christian. A human baby uh, is fed by its parents, right? And growth is natural. But a baby Christian will only grow as much as he purposely reads and obeys and applies the word of uh, the word to his life. Growth is up to him or her. There are Christians who have there are, you know, there are Christians who have been saved for many many years, but spiritually they're still babies. They cannot understand the deeper truths of God's word. So what should a Christian's diet consist of? The word of God. Why is this so? Why is this such a simple answer when we don't take it simply? The Word of God, the truths taught in the Bible, they are rich food for Christians. Peter wrote that God has given us everything we need for life through our growing knowledge of Him. And if you guys want to do this as a homework assignment this week, look up 2 Peter 1, chapters, uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. Because Peter, he lists all these character qualities that need to be added to the beginning point of the Christian faith. So that's 2 Peter 1, 3 through 11. It says a side note. It's your homework assignment. Now, so the first answer is we have to have faith. The second one, uh, you guys out there, I want to make sure everyone awake here because I asked you those questions. You got it in your mind? Right? Which one am I? Am I a backslider, a maintainer, or an overcomer? So faith is the first one. The second one is we need to grow in grace. Grace. One of my favorite books is that uh, it's, it's called uh, uh, Grace is All You Need. Right? So to grow in grace is to mature as Christians. We are saved by grace through faith. And we mature and are sanctified by grace alone. We know that grace is a blessing. It's a blessing we don't deserve. It is God's grace that justifies us. It's God's grace that sanctifies us. And eventually it's God's grace that glorifies us. The sanctification process, becoming more like Christ, it's the same thing as growing in grace. We grow in grace by reading God's word, by letting it dwell within us richly. Colossians 3.16. Let it just grow in us richly. That's why sometimes, uh, back this last Christmas, uh, someone gave me a, this really neat Bible, has like no no, uh, like, uh, no notes in it, no references in it. It's uh, absolutely pure to it. It does have a computer thing that's attached to it, too. But I tell you this, uh, you get into it, and you're reading just the pure word and just letting it sink in, let it settle in. It's amazing what comes up out of that. It's like just going so much deeper into it. You're getting the meat and potatoes of the word that the Holy Spirit teaches you. And that's what it means to dwell in us richly. Now, those actions by themselves, praying and reading the word, they don't mature us. But God uses spiritual disciplines to help us grow. Therefore, maturing in our Christian life is not about what we do, but what about, but about what God does in us by his grace. Understanding and applying God's grace in our lives is important. We're not to impair it by being proud, because God says he resists the proud. It gives grace to the humble. Grace is that attribute of God that enables us to break free from the sinful nature and to follow Him. Grace allows us to break free 
from that sinful nature. It allows us to be free from those things that hold us back. You think about this here, grace protects us. Grace gives us strength. Without God's grace, without his favor, if you want to say it that way too, we would be hopelessly lost in this world. If we didn't have God's grace right now, who knows where we would be at. The more grace we have and ask God for, the more, uh, more mature Christians we will be. Uh, some people just take it so seriously, but this is a serious part of it. Grace is the depth of God's, God's uh, solid food for us. And here's the other thing, too, is to grow in grace does not mean gaining more grace from God. God's grace never increases. It is infinite. It cannot be more, and according to the nature of God, it can never be less. Because it, think about this. He, God gave his only son that whoever believes in should be saved. How much more grace could there possibly be than that? We've gotten all of God's grace. It's all available for us. But to grow in grace and to, is to grow in our understanding of what Jesus did and to grow in our appreciation of the grace we've been given. Because the more we learn about Jesus, the more we will appreciate all he has done. And the more we appreciate his love and sacrifice for us, the more we will perceive this never-ending grace of God. So we got faith, we got grace. Next answer is to me is knowledge. Knowledge. Knowledge is power. You guys ever hear that? Knowledge is power. I mean, uh, some people get credit for it. Francis Bacon, some of us might know this. Francis Bacon got, got, got credit for that. Thomas Hobbes got credit for it. Thomas Jefferson. It's actually from Sanskrit uh, writings, right? But only only when you truly understand it. Jesus brought it out. You know what he said? He, shall, he said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Knowledge is power only when it changes your life. To truly understand what you learn, you must apply it. That's where you get Bloomberg's taxonomy for us in uh, education. Peter also confirms that we need to grow in our knowledge of Jesus and to have an intimate relationship with him because the more we know of him, the more of him will be seen in our lives. And Jesus, uh, sorry, Paul said in Colossians 3, 1-4, he says this, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Where's your mind should be at? On things above. Never, you know, some people say, oh, you ever hear that saying, oh, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. That's a crop, right? People who are heavenly minded are the most earthly good because who's to have their minds on? The, universe, the creator of the universe, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the sovereign god of all creation. Set your minds to things above, not on earthly things. The irony into that is you set your things on above and then you'll be earthly good. Because you know what? The Bible says you died and your life is now hidden with Christ, with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory, Paul tells us. The scriptures contain all the knowledge we ever need to learn of God, his Son, and the Holy Spirit, at least in this life. God's desire for those he has saved is their sanctification and their transformation. God wants to change our lives. He wants us to have better, abundant, more productive, overcoming lives. He wants us to become more holy. He wants, to be, he wants us to be holy like himself. He wants to transform us into the image of the Son. And the way we do this, read the Word, meditate upon it, apply those principles to our lives. You know, trust the promises of God. You know, and as we yield to conviction the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, we dwell within it richly. Then we will prove what 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 18 says. We who with unveiled faces, and I had to bring this up one today, right? Unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory as are being transformed into the likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord. You guys, Jesus is our example. Hebrews 5, 8 through 10 says this, Son, though he was, Jesus, learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who would obey, who obey him, and was designated by God to be a high priest, to be high priest in order of Melchizedek. Now here, now it's word in Hebrews too, we'll get to that. 
We learn that Jesus was fully divine and fully human, and that he was without sin, yet experienced temptation and human weakness. Because of Jesus' unique nature and experience, he can fully relate to our struggles. And, as, and he can do this as he performs his priestly duties. Now focusing on Hebrews 5, verse 8 there, uh, we have an ex there's really an extremely condensed version of Jesus' life on earth. Because you know what? He was the infinite Son of God, who never left, nevertheless, he experienced the limits of space and time and life as we do. You know, God could have God could have gone and created a fully grown man in, in Jesus. But he didn't. You know what he did? He decided to bring him in as a baby. You know what? He could have just, he could have, like he did Adam. Adam, I believe, was created as a holy, holy grown man. You know, he could have, could have done that, rushed him off to the cross, but he didn't. He brought him in as a baby. He entered time. We notice in Philippians chapter 2, and experienced for himself an ordinary human life, from birth to adulthood and to death. Learning and suffering and death are part of life's experiences for all people. And God ensured that his own son would be no exception. So he can understand what it's like to struggle. As God, Jesus did not learn, he didn't need to learn anything, right? Especially obedience. Yet as, at his incarnation, Jesus, he limited himself to the human experience. He chose the weak position of having to learn and grow. Jesus learned obedience, if you want to call it that. Not in the sense that he was prone to disobedience and had to bring rebellious, rebelliousness under control, but in the sense that he fully hindered the human experience. So, as a child, he obeyed his parents. We know this from Luke chapter 2. As an adult, he obeyed the law. And he fulfilled all, uh, all righteousness of the law, requirements of the law. All his life, Jesus completely fulfilled the Father's will. He knew what obedience was prior to the incarnate, his incarnation, incarnation. But he learned obedience by experiencing it. He knows what we've gone through. He knows what it's like to struggle. In every situation, no matter how difficult, the Son was obedient to the Father. The Sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offer my back to those who would beat me. Isaiah chapter 50. Jesus, Jesus learned obedience from what he suffered. And as the divine son of God, Jesus did not have to suffer, but as the son of man, suffering was required to learn obedience. Also, this passage, it often implies enduring a challenge or enduring a challenging process that tra transforms the sufferer. You guys, you never know how strong you are until you're challenged. You know that? That's why, uh, like, right now we got our Dodgers playing, right? You don't know how good they are until you get on the field, do you? That's right. Right, and that ninth inning, last, I mean, that was a disaster. But anyway, do you think they're going to come out over this challenge? I think they're going to overcome, yeah. right? Right? I think so. But I tell you this here. We sometimes have challenging times. Do you ever have a challenging time in your life? We have a challenging time right now. If you don't, I don't know where you've been. You know, we're all challenged. But Jesus has gone through those challenges. He has shown us how to go through them. Jesus chose to endure an unpleasant, challenging process because it was the will of his Father for his brief time on earth. And from that challenge, he finished an altogether righteous human life and had a complete understanding of human frailty and suffering. It was Christ's total human obedience coming through after extreme suffering that qualifies him to be our eternal high priest, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. Now, having been perfected, I, I always this word always got, uh, got gets me here in the passage. Having been perfected, not morally. But in relation to his ministry as our Savior, Jesus is qualified to be the source, the author, the one who gives it to us of eternal salvation for all who obey him. That's verse 9. 
So this astonishing res eternal results of this process that Jesus endured is expounded throughout the Bible. It's wrapped up in this passage. It says this, Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office, but, be but because Jesus lives forever. How long? Forever. He has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. Because he always lives to intercede for him. You guys, you're not in this alone. He's up there for you. He's up there watching over you. He's up there conceding, you know, uh, interceding before the Father right now. Such a highly high priest who truly meets our needs. He is one. He is holy. He's blameless. He's pure. He's set apart. You know, he's set apart for us, for sinners. Us sinners. He is exalted above all the heavens. And unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day by day. You know, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of other people. He sacrificed his sins once for all, for all when he offered himself. So therefore, we are no longer bound or held down by those sins. We don't have that baggage hanging on us. We need to give it up to him. We need to lay it at the foot of the cross. He sacrificed for our sins once and for all when he offered us himself. What an example to follow. So be of good cheer, Jesus says. I have overcome the world. That is power. Now, I asked you earlier, how open-minded are you? Now, I know you're open-minded about a solution. Because the way I see it, you have how many choices? Three choices. You can continue to be one of those milk toast, ineffective, mediocre Christians just maintaining. Or worse, you'd be one of those backsliding, regressing, barely existing, loss of muscle mass, not to mention dementia, ineffective, going nowhere but down, lack of identity, nobodies. Or... You can have that strong, abundant, productive, clear-eyed, healthy, educated, spiritual life with all the benefits and, of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, evangelical, Pentecostal experience, miracle-making, light and darkness, strong tower, love, hope, faith that clearly tells the world that you are a force to be reckoned with, an overcomer. So which one are you going to choose? You don't have to tell me out loud. But I know right in your, right in your mind, right where, where you're at right now. You know where you're at right now. You know where you need to go. And I pray it's an overcomer. Now, I've got something even really more important to tell you. So lean in and listen. You have no one, especially people out there on Facebook and YouTube right now, no one has words of eternal life except for Jesus. And even... Right. And even though things in our world they can look bleak right now, remember this, Jesus said this, Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So do you want to be counted as one who overcomes? Now, you may be watching today, you may be walking by, and not knowing Jesus as your Savior. At some point in your life, you have to come to Jesus. Now's the best time. For now, you can come to Him as Savior. If you're one of those people who think that only God can judge you, you don't want to come to Jesus as your judge. Come to him now. He will give you the faith to believe in, to believe. Then, he'll, then you'll have someone to believe in. Then you'll have someone to have faith in, have someone to have hope in. You'll have, he'll be the person who upholds you with his righteous right hand. He'll lead you into all truth. He is the one you can hope in. Well, what's the next step? The next step is this. To ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins. Not because you're going to be better. Not because you deserve it. But because he said if you confess our sins, he is, he is faithful. He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is when Jesus went to the cross. He died and paid sin's debt for you and for me. And when we ask him to forgive us, he will. Then he'll, be able, then he'll start guiding you. He'll start leading. He'll start help. He'll help you understand the Word of God. You won't be one of those people out there saying, "I don't understand the Bible." He'll help you with that. He'll change your whole life, and I trust that you'll do that. Whoever you are, wherever you are, God is willing to change your life if you let Him.
So how do you do that? Well, it all begins with a prayer. You want a life of faith and know that God is always with you. And when you pass on from this earth, you will forever be with God in heaven, right where you're at. Whether you're on the couch, right, whether you're still in bed, you're at your kitchen table, I just want you to say this simple prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know you're the Savior who died upon the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. Jesus, come into my life and forgive me. I choose to follow you from this moment forward as my Savior, as my Lord, and as my God, and as my friend. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen? Amen. Now, if you said that prayer, I want to welcome you to the family of God. This is something truly to celebrate. You know that you don't, your life doesn't have to be one of just maintaining, that you have a life and life more abundant. And I pray that you just, uh, that you just like, give it all over to God where he can lift you up, show you his grace, his love, his favor. He'll give you faith, he'll give you knowledge, he'll give you peace that transcends all understanding. And he'll give you love that you will never understand before, uh, other than it comes from God himself. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. Let's sing. Your kindness leads me to innocence. Your goodness draws me to your side.
You are good, Lord. We just love you this morning. Thank you that we could be here. Now the sunshine is coming out, and what a beautiful morning. We just thank you, Lord, for this great word that you've given us this morning and just for your love in Jesus' name. Before we close this morning, we always have the offering back in the back by Rich. We're not allowed to pass it around. Um, but Rich, would you please pray a blessing over our offering this morning? Precious Heavenly Father, we just thank you, God, for being in our presence, for being here that touches our hearts. Let us know that you are still our God, that nothing on earth can stand against you. Lord, we just thank you for Pam being here and, and Pete. We just praise your holy name for that. We just lift them up to you, Lord. Guide them. Let them know that you are still their God. Lord, we just pray for little Samantha, Lord, that you just touch your heart, touch your kidneys, Lord, that you just feel them right now, Lord, in your holy name. Lord, we pray for the people that are here. We pray that you just touch their hearts. And we just pray for the offering, Lord, that you just bless them double, Lord, the ones that can give and bless the ones that can. Give us a great week coming up, Lord, and just give you the glory. In your name, amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next Sunday. Have a blessed week in Jesus' name.